Well, this is going to be a little bit different. It's a bit of an experiment, but it could be fun. It could be fun. So, I decided that as I had quite a lot of comments building up, and I have got to start back up with the comment response, especially on the key ships videos, etc. And I'll, I will get round to them when I'm not. Well, you see, the thing is, they don't take that much time to do, realistically. Um, because usually I have most of the information already available as part of my research, so I don't have to go find out new information. And it's usually just a recording thing. But the trouble is, if you consider today, I spent a good, good four hours of my day on the phone to various lawyers and bankers because, for some reason, despite the fact that I am apparently paying them all a lot of money, they can't talk directly to each other and just sort out their problems themselves. I have to act as the go-between. I'm fairly sure it's something to do with data protection, they tell me, but there is part of me which just goes, is there a form I can sign which allows you to talk to each other? Because I only understand, like, every other word you're using. But we'll leave that to one side. That takes time in a day. Combine it with packing up a house, which might have three people who have book collections that rival small libraries, as in community, as in small public libraries in size, or maybe medium-sized public libraries in size. And uh, yeah, the time for doing this sort of thing doesn't come around that often. But, I hurt my hand yesterday. You all have already seen a video with a bandage on, and I took the bandage off. Oh, was it yesterday or the day before? It was the day before. Uh, it was Monday. Today's Wednesday, isn't it? I think today's Wednesday. And so, um, yeah, it's getting better. But don't drop large pieces of stone on your hand, or rather... If you're working on the floor and sorting something out and moving stuff around, and someone is carrying a large piece of a large piece of said stone, um, then tell them not to drop it on you. It really helps if they don't drop it on you. It it really is a benefit. But this is the random popular comment response. And before we get into this too much. Definition today, random, as in I've gone through looking for comments and just seeing what looks to be interesting to me. Popular, as in most lots of people are saying a similar thing. I've been discussing a similar point. Uh, or there's been a big, big long discussion chain around that topic. And then I have to make usually, if I've seen that, even I might not necessarily go for the big chain, I might go for the chain which looks the most... How do I put this? I'm not going to be picky about... I'm not going to be picking it apart. I don't want to look like I'm looking for people to pick apart. But that's what today's video is. Share book plug as always. Thank you for everyone who has bought it. Thank you to everyone who's liked, shared and subscribed to the channel. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel in all the ways you can do. Thank you very much. It, you make it possible and you make all the history stuff I'm doing possible at the moment. Especially with the new... Oh, I'm not getting into it. So, this was from... Star, uh, this was from... What was it from? I think it was from the video about... Star Destroyers. And it was an interesting discussion. Quite, I put it through a point and I asked a comment of, you know, what do you think the Star Trek fleets and the 1930s navies are going to be? And sometimes I ask questions in videos and they get barely a response. And sometimes they get tons of responses. This time they got tons of responses. And I always like it when I do get responses because that's why I asked them. And I asked them at the end. And so if you're ever wondering, why are these people all commenting this? It's because at the end of the video, usually, I have asked a question. And this question is particularly cool, because it says, In answer to the question, I would say, and this is from Friendly Sea Mine. Friendly Sea Mine. That's, that, that's a something. In answer to the question. Seriously, Friendly Sea Mine? Does it mean it's a sea mine, a sea mine that, I, that 
personally has been laid by people friendly to me. So it's not going to... It is so I know where it is, so I don't get blown up when I go past it. No. Not getting distracted by names again. Not getting distracted by names. Okay. In answer to the question, I would say the Royal Navy is the TNG era federation. Sure, there are new designs about, but it's mostly older proven ships, which, let's be honest, say, have been modified, upgraded, and modernized in time. Kriegsmarine, late Dominion War Breen ships, they have a great wonder weapon. Without that, not much else. Yeah. I always did feel the Breen involvement in the Dominion War was kind of uh, kind of sad. They came in, they were all this powerful, then they worked out, hang on. Klingon shield seemed to survive better. And, oh, it's a shield modulation fix. And then the entire weapons wiped out. And you sort of go, that was a bit of a letdown, Star Trek writers. Honestly, that was a bit of a letdown. Let's be honest, there was the whole warp issues. That was a bit of a letdown, how quickly that was dealt with. They sometimes make these things some major issues, and then it turns out to be, it's a shield modulation fix. And you go, yes, these are incredibly advanced systems, but also you go... Okay, in the middle of combat, did no one think, let's modulate shields a bit? And I realise... I realized there was some more stuff for that, and it was found, the answer was accidental, but it was a weapon which was specifically designed to drain shields and make a ship defenseless, and yet no one had A, seen to consider it before as a prior threat, and B, the Breen hadn't considered as Breen hadn't sort of considered, what happens if our system stops working, if they work out an anecdote, uh, an answer to it? They didn't have a follow-up weapon system. And then, of course, you had that great scene in the defense of Cardassia, where the founder is talking to the, uh, the Breen commander, going, but your counsel has been so valuable to me. Really? They are so short-sighted, they have put all their efforts into a wonder weapon. We're, and they've got nothing to follow it up if it doesn't work. Their entire military capability boils down to we can do this as long as your shields fit this criteria. That's not so much a wonder weapon as a party trick. Soviet Navy for me is the Roman and Star Empire. Lots of spies. Has to be bigger than everyone else. And nobody is sure if the ships are actually there. Ray Jamuna would be the vulcanized navy of the 2140s. I just like the aesthetic. Oh, I'll accept that. I'm slightly cheating, and not mean to cause events, but I'm going for Lake World War II America and saying the Borg, because they would just keep making the same ship design until the end of time. I'd like to disagree with that point, but there is a logic to it. There is a logic to it. I always said in the Cold War era, the Federation Navy is definitely the American Navy of the higher Cold War period, which has lots of ships. It's always got a small thrusting group of, these are the latest tech ships, but there's more ships around them. And some ships are just in service for a long, long time. But there again, that's been the secret of a lot of large navies. If you consider this, one of the problems we have today is not fleet here with fleet numbers is a production was cut a lot in the 1980s and early 1990s and all those ships which were supposed to be built weren't built because of the piece of evident but also because they've been happily selling off quite a lot of hulls and no one stuck any hulls into ordinary i.e. reserve status as far as the navy is concerned and it's one of the interesting things is the Royal Navy's reserve status for a ship is considered it's in ordinary and for operations, it's commissioned. And that really tells you a whole lot about navies and how they should work. Ships in ordinary are sitting there being maintained, not being used. They are there for when you need them. Ships which are commissioned are what you need right now. You commission what you need. Hmm. It's interesting. 
Battleship Gun Survivability. Ooh, this one was a fun one. I think this one came from the discussion of the twelve of the Royal Navy's uh, flirtations with various battleship designs in nineteen thirty, early nineteen thirties, uh, late nineteen twenties, early nineteen thirties. Andrew Cox: Three triples loses one, t lose one turret. You have six guns. Four twins lose one turret. You have six guns. Lose another turret. In either case, you no longer have enough guns to fight effect a salvo fire. You still do. You need at least three guns for effective salvo fire. As long as you have three, you can do a salvo. It's you know, where is the extra survivability? I can see it with the turret farms, Argincourt, I presume not Argenvu, Argincourt, Fuso Texas, but not in the three triple versus four twin guns. It's not so much guns as turret survivability, and was a pretty widespread belief at the time. Went like this: A three turret ship can only afford to lose two turrets and still be able to fight. A four turret, a four can lose three and still fight. Now, yes, and on BT is one of its leading proponents, but also it's about the spacing out of the guns as well. It's about the fact that you can have an arrow beam with four twins, and therefore you can have also you can have a narrower citadel. And you can therefore have more space between the brain and gauge, barbettes, especially for the turrets and the outer hull. And spacing is part of the defense as well. So it's believed that A, twin turrets, four twin turrets was a more survivable layout, but also that having the number, uh, create a number of turrets, you lose one, you've still got three turrets. Uh, you've said, you know, you lose one, you've still got six guns. Yes. But it's not so much the gun, it's at this point, it's the guns and turrets of our building. And, yeah, four guns, perfectly fine for a salvoing. Three is, f is fine, it's the minimum. You prefer to have six. But, yeah, you can do it. Six. Six is the minimum preferred number to allow you the assurance of having being able to drop down. Okay, that that's the thing. Six allows you to drop to four and you can still sort of do it. That's why Renown and Repulse have four forward, two aft. Um, if it's just the stern gun, then th that's available and they are running away under that circumstance. And that's just firing as best it can and hoping it hits something. It's a, it's a spray and pray approach with a 15 inch gun. But of course, one of the really interesting things they didn't consider, oh, apparently in this discussion at all, was the idea of four triple gun alert arrangement. Because I would argue that's the best policy. And yes, you're going to have to build a bigger ship, but you can already make a triple to a ship, triple inch, a triple gun ship with sufficient armor. Let's be honest, Nelson Rodney. But of course, getting that all underneath to thirty-five thousand tons would be interesting, without a lot of creative accounting. I think I might be more morally capable of doing the creative accounting than most of the people this period. And we had the Hell Diver discussion now. There were lots of interesting comments on this. Um, I could get into the full discussions which are going on, on sort of under Otto von Bismarck's uh, one and Prince and Tonga, but I'm going to go for the one which is most uh, most against what I said. Um, Jag's Domain, uh, honestly, when I first saw this comment, I thought, has he actually listened the whole way through the video? Because what you said, this is a situation where you are right, perhaps technically, but in reality, for the people that are having to fly the thing, you are completely 100% wrong. They didn't want the plane because it wasn't nearly as good as a flyer as the Dauntless was, and these are the guys that are going to be using the plane every day to go after the thing, so it's an engineer versus reality. Well. Okay. Jag's the main. I think, as most of the other comments would say, they would agree with you. In 1943, at, when the first version came in, it had issues, and there were certainly problems. One of the problems was it could carry a lot more ammunition, and they did try to keep trying to load it up fully versus the Dauntless. 
But there is also the familiarity I expect with the Dauntless. Um, one of the interesting things that might be a shock to you, but it's just as strong a feeling in the Royal Navy between the Fairy Swordfish and the Albacore. The Royal Navy, the, the Fleet Air Arm Pilots, the official, the official Fleet Air Arm songbook actually has an entire song about which has the chorus of Bring Back My Peggy to Me. Which is all about getting uh, bring back the swordfish, take away the sort of the, the albacore. But a year later, those pilots were uh, a year later. Those pilots would never have exchanged the albacore once it was working properly for the swordfish because it did have advantages. And the trouble is, and I'm not accusing you of this in any way, shape, or form. I'm sure you have done a lot of reading and have gone around Zobic. But what I have found with quite a lot, especially of the popular history books, they do... Basically, the battles of Coral Sea, Midway, the big battles. Then they get to about the introduction of the, Hel of the Helldiver. And suddenly they take huge leaps. Operations are discussed in a few lines. It's a bit here, a bit there, a bit there. As the action is really elsewhere. And then it's a concentration on attacking a moto and yeah, all, all, all those sort of things. But it, it basically skips over quite a lot of the way things develop in that period. And one of the joys I have with some books, and I'm not going to pick them up here, is some of the best books. Some of the books I actually put my students to go and learn from. I go, oh, go study them. They are great. On certain sections of World War Two, they are excellent. On certain sections of World War One, they are excellent. But they hit, and they are very good at communicating about the high-profile sections of those wars. The war, what things that most people can do. And suddenly, what you get in a lot of the filler is people don't clarify or explain their points. And you can easily find, like I can, if you wanted me to, I could go to the year of the Albacore's introduction into certain Royal Navy service, and I can find quotes aplenty. Which, if I took just those quotes, you would honestly believe the Albacore was the worst aircraft that ever fly. That it would never hit anything with a torpedo. That it was absolutely pointless. And that, frankly, the Royal Navy should have shot everyone in its high in its command structure who was involved in its procurement. But I could also take the quotes from a year later, and they're basically singing the praises, and they're doing the complete opposite. And that's the trouble of a lot of these aircraft that get a reputation. You said there is a phrase you never get a chance to make a second first impression. You really don't. And I worry about that with some of my videos when people are watching me for the first time, especially the more zany ones where I'm wearing, I don't know, a turkey hat and those sort of things. But leaving that to one side, it's even more true with aircraft. Because whereas I get to make a first impression in every single video, They get to make a first impression when they enter the service. And they're going to have to impress the toughest crowd they're ever going to work with. The pilots who have been flying the very mature version of the design previous to them. Most of those pilots, some of them might have flown the first versions of the Dauntless, which was also atrocious. But the odds are there aren't many of those left. They're mostly, if they're still alive and still flying, are in senior, far more senior positions now. And that's the other problem. You have a constant promotion and churn of people going back to become instructors and all sorts of things. And the Dauntless, of course, goes back to being used as the instructor aircraft. Ultimately, I have to say, and there's a reason, Jags Domain, I picked your comment out of all to have up there and to talk about. It's because whilst you did express this, you were, A, very polite, I felt, in how you did it, and very reasoned in your approach. Okay, 
I can understand your reasoning. I don't agree with it, but I can understand it. There were others who took a far stronger line than you did, and have basically accused the US Navy of being bribed to allow the Helldiver to come into service. And this I found amazing. Because for it to work, they'd have had to bribe Admiral King. And I know I've said this in a couple of lives since discussing this and this, but can we all just agree one thing? That Admiral King, the most even-tempered man you'll ever meet, constantly angry, is not a good target for bribing. How are you going to bribe him? Give him an Admiral Beatty-shaped punching bag for him to beat up all day? He'll get through it in five minutes. The man's anger will shred it. You just... And the reality is that's not needed. They've got other developments going through. If, honestly... The Helldiver was developed for a war which didn't take place. Because by that point, as several other commenters have put here, not even the Germans are doing dive bombing, really. You still have the capability. You still have the capability. But it's not really being used for how you attack ships or how you attack targets. And the big thing that the Helldiver really was used for, which is a real disappointment for its name, was a bomb truck. And that caused even more discussion, I have to say in the comments, because there was a point which I felt I had explained, that if you loaded up the fighter aircraft, which could carry almost as many bombs as the Helldiver fully, then they couldn't keep go to the same range the Helldiver could go to. Helldiver was far longer range in that form. People then sort of a bit worried about having fighter defense, and basically the answer is then the fighters don't carry bombs on that journey. The fighters take extra fuel tanks and keep up nicely with the Helldiver as it go, and Helldivers as they go drop their bombs. But again, as I said in the live, uh, in, the, in the video about it, in the recorded video on the Helldiver, the reality is, the Helldiver was not as good a bomber as the Avenger. The Avenger could carry far more bombs. It was a far better bomb truck. And that means the poor Helldiver is sort of... It's left with nothing it can take the lead in. Which means it becomes not only doesn't it have the big... Uh, big events of Coral Sea, Midway, etc., which allowed a Dauntless to set up its fame and its legend. Not only is it really an okay aircraft in a period where there are absolute legends flying around it, which changes some of the metrics of how we evaluate it, but even the missions it is doing and is capable of doing quite well, it's the secondary option because there are the legends around it are better at doing those missions think about it what would be the specific mission you go you know what I want a mission I want a mission where I need a bomb truck but Avenger is too big for what I need and the Corsair etc they're too short ranged so therefore it's going to be the Hell Diver. That would be a very interesting mission to try and make it that one the perfect mission. You, you're not going to find it. Ah, the Kriegsmarine seaplane carriers. Now, this was another interesting discussion. This was a, a cool video to do, and it was a cool discussion. Uh, Teutonic Knight 661 came up with this. Considering the huge advantage that the U Wolf Packs was a spotting, I'd say the seaplane support for spotting would have been very useful in the early months of the war. Until they would have been found, that is. Having them generally be faster would have helped. Getting into... <laughs> yeah. Float plane torpedo bombers. Well, yes, there's the Heinkel HE-115, which was a float reconnaissance torpedo bomber. And it was an interesting aircraft. They did recce and SAR missions, as Otto von Bismarck puts there. I would say this was a question I was asking, and it was interesting to see some of the responses from people. It really was. 
again, I would say the trick has got to be to make those ships look like merchant ships when they are not launching aircraft. They've got to have sort of canvas or boxes which fired a cat which have their catapult to launch the aircraft and they've got to be able to recover the aircraft pretty darn quickly so the map system would be really useful and a crane which and a hangar system they could get them into so what ideally they'd need and this is going to sound James Bond-esque but bear with me so imagine the ship was built with a sort of like it looked like a sort of standard uh, standard freighter at the time, but maybe the hull, a sort of a bit of a section of hull, opens up, uh, a sort of cloak opens that way, and a bit opens up that way, and you find that the helic of the aircraft is on a catapult which launches, and at the back you have a crane which literally lifts it up, uh, lifts the aircraft up, deposits in, and there is a through structure, so they automatically are put at the back of the queue, and then there's sort of the other aircraft in front of them, and they could have, let's say, three or four, or four, even five or six aircraft in this queue system on that travelway, like they planned for the Graf Zeppelin, and I think that would be a really, really good system, and would allow them to keep up a constant reconnaissance, and allow them to maybe fairly um, able to hide their presence and what they're doing. I think, and sort of operate out of neutral ports. As long as they could avoid some of the more deep inspections. But considering Altmark and how she had, how she got through quite a large chunk of Norway avoiding inspections, I do believe the Germans were capable of that. Now, again, you make up an interesting point of, is the British finding them? And again, that would be the Enigma sort of scenario, but for the British... Uh, finding them too quickly would reveal that they cracked Enigma. So they'd have to come with reasons for them finding them. They would have to have patrol aircraft go over. And what happens if the ship does nothing suspicious? They signal the ship. Ship signals back. They can theoretically, you said they could go, well, maybe they noticed that it was the wrong signal, but that's going to take time, and that allows the ship to move area, and if the ship's still found when it's doing so, it, it, it becomes a whole thing of what's going on. The British almost have to, would have to develop a whole search routine to prove they were finding these aircraft, or these ships accidentally. But... If they had been available, especially 1941 era, when the wolf packs are actually getting up to the strength. In 1939, 1940, there are barely enough submarines for the Germans to do the military missions, let alone the economic warfare missions. Um, yeah, that would have been... It would have been worrying for the British, because it would have been one of the things to also counter the sort of advantages that they were trying to use with Enigma, etc., to give distance and to ma uh, sort of massage things so oh the wolf pack missed us because uh, the we and the wolf pack going oh we missed them because we were off half a uh, they must have been off a half a degree on the course and now they're over there rather than coming straight through us it's, it's so annoying well if you have an uh, aircraft up spotting and especially the availability of a seaplane carrier to have aircraft up spotting uh, that's a large area covered, and they spot targets. I I don't necessarily think about a torpedo using them as torpedo bombers because that adds a lot of weight to a seaplane, and will tend to make it more difficult for it to take off on land and require more space and especially smoother water usually. So I think more as a reconnaissance asset, and. For the Allies, that complicates things because again, if these things continue to be a capability for war, then your escort carriers you either have to make them bigger or you have to carry a mixed air group of ASW aircraft, a swordfish, and some fighters. Or alternatively, you arm the swordfish and have them engage in air to air duels with the seaplanes. Which 
which if they have big floats etc on are, and the, the swordfish is in its its carrier configuration and it's armed well, let's say with rockets and maybe had some cannon added on instead of machine guns uh, or had its guns upgraded in some way could actually have been an interesting that that I so want to try and design that if I had a software for like UAD for aircraft I would be designing that right now and working out the the actual scenario of it fighting it I'd want to see what the air to air combat of uh, HE-115 versus a swordfish armed with cannon and rockets would be. <laughs> oh. That was an interesting. That was really interesting. Uh, and then we had the Zoom Boom full mark. Now, I picked out a comment from Jamie Seidel of Armored Carriers here. Because... There are quite a lot of discussions over the Fulmar. And again, you might notice there's a bit of a theme approaching key aircraft in that I've gone after some of the sacred cows of history in terms of this is a terrible aircraft or this is this and this is that. And I've gone, well, actually, are you sure about that? And actually look at what the crews were saying at the time and look what was actually happening versus when we try and make those things fit a mould defined by another aircraft. The problem with the Fulmar is its mould is defined by the Spitfire and even the poor Hurricane has trouble with that one. And realistically they are very different aircraft because if you wanted to do what a Fulmar was doing with a Spitfire well as the legacy of the Seafire shows you end up breaking a lot of them. And they're not really necessarily the best at flying cat as combat air patrols in their 1940-1941 configuration. Because I know someone's going to go, well, they were flying combat air patrol in 1945. Yes, they were, but the Spitfire of 1945 is a long way from the Spitfire of 1940. It's a long way from the Spitfire of 1940. And that's the other problem you get with a lot of naval history. And that we look at the tactics which are used in 1945, and we think aircraft could always do them. Now, I would say one of the interesting things here is uh, Carl's asking about Carl Gasberg here is asking about repeated attacks. You often don't have time for repeated attacks. Now, let me explain this. This is often the thing leveled up against the mark. They couldn't make another attack. But think about it. So, you have, let's say, these are your zones. Out from here to here. Outer zone is your fighter zone. And I said, under the doctrine, they break up attacks into smaller groups. Their aim is to break up wings into squadrons and flights, basically. And do that by diving through the formation, blasting away and forcing them to separate off to avoid the fire. Okay, they do that. And then you have the Hay of EAA, which is breaking them up even more and is turning this into an absolute blasting, scary, booming zone where you break up and you're into individual aircraft, maybe a pair of aircraft, but preferably individual aircraft. And then you get into this range here... Which project where you get your your medium AA, 40 millimeters, and those engaging, and they will actually try and shoot you down. That's their actual thought of focus is to try and shoot you down. The others, if they shoot you down, that's great. That's an added bonus. But if they don't, their purpose is to divide you up. And then you've got the light AA, which is absolutely trying to shred you before you can bomb the ship. So. As you get closer, the mission sort of changes. Now think about that, and think about any point in this further layers where you would like the fighter to come back and attack this wave again. They don't want to. So they are instead climbing up to try and engage the next wave coming in. That's what they're going to do. Now the point is, what you normally do is if the carrier is back here, cap diverted to engage enemy wave. Alert fighters launch to replace cap. Next wave is coming in. Uh, cap, now the alert, fi the alert fighters are cap, now go engage. Alert fighters, 
are launched to new alert for just launched to replace them. The old, the original cap, they're either, they're going to gain altitude and they will either be used to attack another one of the waves coming in, maybe the third wave coming in, and to give the alert for, or, or something like that, or they'll be called back to the carrier to be re to have their ammunition replenished and their fuel replenished, and they might get launched again. So. When you think about it, and people start going, well, they can't do this. Well, if the system's running right, they don't need to. And if the system's got enough slack in it, they don't need to. It does, though, they are right, it does become a problem when you start to drop below a certain number of fighters. This is where the minimum number of 18 comes from. There is a reason why you suddenly see this figure starting to become important. The Royal Navy... Works this out in about 1932-31. Some exercises Henderson does, and Henderson does, as rear animal aircraft carriers. And very quickly it becomes that 18 fighters are how you can guarantee that cap up in the air. And you don't want to drop below that number. The interesting thing about the maps is it still adds up to this day. And it's one of the things which caused interesting discussions around the Invincible class. The fact that, well, A, they were actually designed for helicopters smaller than the Sea Kings because someone when designing them didn't take notice of the fact that the new helicopter coming in was going to be significantly larger than the principal air helicopter which was being used at the time. Certainly not things which would get to Merlin sized. Which, of course, then complicated things even more by having their <laughs> wheels in the completely opposite configuration and therefore their hard points needed for them and the uh, the deck strength positions needed for them in a completely uh, reverse position from that of a Sea King. And the Sea Harrier went from being... Uh, we'll need eight to guarantee a couple of aircraft over up in formation to, you know what, the idea of just operating with two aircraft in the air uh, doesn't really work. It, 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 we're looking at caps of two of two to four aircraft, depending on the fret scenario. Oh, really? And that also means you need 18. Which is why the British came up with the uh, tailored air group. Which could see them having a multi-mission of um, 12 Harriers and 10 Sea Kings. Or a multi-mission strike and anti-surface warfare and etc. Of 18 Harriers and 4 Sea Kings. Small theme going on there. And of course in modern Queen Elizabeth class, it's exactly why they are the size they are and why they can carry the air group they can. Uh, 40 aircraft. Okay. It's up to 36 F-35B Lightnings, but let's be honest, more often than not, uh, we are hoping to have them constantly carrying 18, which can do their air carry out their air defense role. And you might be wondering, oh, hang on, Alex. You're talking the wrong maths here. Why have you got 18 aircraft if you want to maintain a cap of four, of four constantly? Four in the air, four on deck alert... And then that's 10 down in the hangar, surely. It is. Because at least one of those aircraft is probably going to be undergoing serious maintenance. And another one just could be being annoying that day. So basically, 18 is the minimum. If you're going to look at the US Navy, they tend to go for slightly larger than 18. Because 18's the minimum. Not best practice. It's the minimum. <laughs> It, it, it's kind of like the opposite of speed limits, where speed limits are the upper limit of what you can go on the road, not what you necessarily should be aiming for. Uh, I always say this because some people get to country roads in the UK and they see national speed limit and they say, well, national speed limit means I can do 60 or 70 on this, this single track road. And I'm going, If you try doing 70 here, you are going to end up in a hedge. I mean, there are turns here where you are going to literally turn a 480 degrees in what seems like a maximum distance of two car lengths. There is no way you can do that at that speed. 
so calm down. But yes, the British basically, when defining the Queen Elizabeth class, went, well, we, we, we tried to do this on the Invincibles and it didn't work. But the thing is, that same cap number works for anti-submarine warfare. If you want to maintain aircraft out from the carrier hunting submarines, and if you, depending on your escort numbers, those carrier aircraft are going to be even more important, you'll need at least 18. Notice something with the 40 aircraft air group. The roughly 40 aircraft air group. It can be a little bit more. It allows you for 18 F-35s and 18 Merlins in all their different configurations. In fact, you could even have 22 Merlins and have some of them in their airborne early warning version. And that all comes back to that old zoom boom system. These days, though, it's worse for aircraft because we think about zoom boom is a World War II tactic. Modern tactics, of course, they'll be lofting their missiles at their targets and... Uh, we would prefer them never to have to engage with their guns, because if they have to, then a lot has gone wrong. So the best thing for the cat to do is to rip off their missiles, come back, rearm, keep their guns in case they do have to dogfight, but the whole point of the F-35 with its stealth capabilities is it's supposed to get the jump on its opponent before its opponent gets the jump on it. So it launches, hopefully engages them, and when it's coming back, then... Well, if, as, it's gone off to, as the cap's gone off to engage, the alert fighters should have launched and taken up cap position. And the fighters from below should have come up to the deck. Again, there's two lifts, which can each take two aircraft. Four onto the deck. And there they're ready to go. You bring the aircraft which have just been engagement in. You check them over, make sure they're all fine. And you, re, uh, you launch, you know, you... If you manage the situation, you might end up with eight aircraft on the deck at that point. You might put the other the four aircraft which just landed down in the, into the hangar. You might already be launching the new alert fighters because the alert the cap the new the alert to cap might have already had to go off might already be off going off engaging next wave. It's a conveyor belt. That's the reality of it. And if you think about it, once you're, you're, you're 18, very quickly is four groups of four and two, pe two spares. So that's one engaging enemy, one getting to cap position to be able to engage the next wave, one on deck alert ready, uh, arming up to go, and maybe one returning or one back on the deck. And that's your four groups used up very quickly. And that's if you haven't had signals that there's going to be a major attack coming in, so you have launched your alert fire just to bolster your cap and bring it up to eight aircraft up there. Whenever I've seen people putting forward 36 strike aircraft for bottom, I think that's a great idea. But then you're going to need to be able to base your anti-submarine warfare helicopters and your other assets for that mission from a lot of other ships in the in the task group. Setting out something as a strike carrier with just fighters loaded on it, an aircraft, is a great, great idea in a permissive environment when no one can come and attack your ship. One of the other jokes you have with carrier size is that people um, talk about a lot of these ships as if they're a product of national ego. No, it's often a product of what you want to do with them. If you want to be fully mission, mission capable of all missions in all circumstances, you need a large carrier because you need a large air group. Again, multiply that out. Okay, let's say I want to do a strike package as well. Well, ideally, I would be looking at a 60 plus air group size. And if you're really being sensible, you'd want to be talking about a 72 air group size, 24 air group aircraft for each of those roles, 24 fighters, 24 strike aircraft, 24 support anti-submarine warfare aircraft. And that's how you very quickly get up to the American air group sizes. The moment you start factoring in, I want to be able to do this. Okay, that allows me to be striking maybe one or two missions at a time. Okay, I'd really like to be able to strike more than that and... 
Maybe I'd like to do longer range. Buddy stores, all those things add in. Okay, and I'd like to do electronic warfare to suppress enemy air defenses to increase the ch chance of my strike group of surviving. You very quickly find yourself with another 24 added on. 96 aircraft. Which is where it all comes from. That's, that's what drives the size of your carrier. What do you want to do with it? And what scenarios do you envisage that it being in? Uh, you could argue that the Invincibles and quite a lot of some decisions in terms of the British procurement, whether that's for the Army, the Air Force, or the Navy, but also for American procurement and other things recently, has been plagued by people not thinking enough about what kind of scenarios these systems are going to find themselves fighting in. What kind of scenarios you're going to be in, going to be in action against. What's your likely deterrence measures as well? And just because missions can profile... It's not just about what you think you're likely to do. It's what do you want to deter from happening. So what do you need to have the very obvious capability to do? So having the major strike capability. Added on to the major defense capability of the task group. Added on to the other measures that your carrier can bring. That basically tells people, oh, they're prepared to do those sort of, those sort of operations. So that means if I do this, this, or this, they have the capability to do it. And that can literally affect your opponent's thinking. Remember, humans are very capable of self-censorship, and they're very capable of talking themselves out of things. If you give them a reason to do so. If you give them something which they can logically attach onto to do so. It's how you de-escalate most situations. If you think about that, when you're teaching someone to de-escalate a situation... The first few things you do is you give someone an uh, you give someone an easy ladder for them to back down on without losing face. If you're ever in a club and one of the things you can be taught to do when you're de-escalating a situation is you decide exactly who you're going to bring in as support. You can decide, am I dealing with this kind of person who if they see a big bloke come up here to back me up, they're going to take that as a challenge? Or are they going to take that as a, oh good lord, they're colossal. This is no, and uh, There is no dishonor in backing down to this. In which case, call in the big bloke. Or are they a type who likes to... How do I put this? Pretend they're chivalrous in front of the fairer sex. To use that old phraseology of my old, very old instructor when I was being having this discussed with me. I, you bring in the, fem uh, the female team member to act as your backup and as your second person there. And I was sort of going, oh, well, there's a pretty lady here. I, I don't want to be, you know, I, I have to be nice and impress her, that sort of thing. You have to judge that situation. It's the same when we're deterring countries. It's the same. You have to always think through what you can do to give them an easy ladder. And sometimes that thing is that shit doesn't even have to be brought up. The mere fact that ship's capability exists stops them doing something. If we consider the Falklands War, which is a scenario I will refer to quite happily on this channel, the Argentines specifically took as one of their cues the fact that the British no longer had a proper carrier. I.e., they looked at the carriers and said those are anti-submarine warfare ships, Limited air defense ships, they can't do strike. They can't do a proper cap. They're entirely dependent upon their allies. Therefore, they can't do this mission. And you go, well, they did manage to do it. We did it by overloading two carriers with more aircraft than they were supposed to carry and stretching them beyond belief. And this is when you get into the really interesting discussion of the Queen Elizabeth class and whether or not they should have actually been larger, i.e. a 72 aircraft capacity aircraft carrier, or at least the 60 aircraft capacity carrier, and whether they should have been Catabar nuclear powered. 
when you look at the mission profile versus the uh, mission profile of Britain's deterrence mission, as well as its likely operational mission. Now, based on their operational missions and likely operational requirements, Queen Elizabeth's are more than perfect. Deterrence profile, you can make a case they could, should have been something different. And should have been bigger and nuclear powered and all those things. But that's a judgment call. Is there enough value? Is there enough financial value to justify the cost of doing that? Because that will have been more expensive in terms of procurement of the carrier. There's also a real argument that whether it wouldn't have actually been better to have, instead of paying for three and a half carriers and taking delivery of two because of the way the deal was was structured in order to stave them off from coming in service, would have actually been to get free and just have one in ordinary. But that is for other minds other than I to argue about on, on this day. And then we get to the Fisher Goes Carrier. Now, this was something which I didn't expect to be such a big hit with people. And a lot of discussions about it. And in this one especially, I'm going to expand it because it was it was quite a meaty thread. So there was a lot of words coming up into here. A lot of words. And I'll pause it as well. I'll leave it so you can pause it here if you want to read it all. But of course it was to do with the illustri uh, with HMS Furious and the scenario of her conversion. Here's the interesting thing. What delayed them getting built? What was the biggest problem they getting built? Was it the arm plate? No, the British had lots of that rolling off, especially the size used for them, so they could have carried the same armour. In terms of carry designs, did they have any lying around? Well, they had the Hermes design lying around. Already worked out in the study work through. So that is going to be the basis of the design. Okay, but they're going for furious, courageous, glorious size vessels. Instead of Hermes size vessels. And speed vessels. Elevator mechanism? No, that's actually fairly simple. And there's lots of elevator construction systems going on. Is it going to be great? Well, no, none of the first aircraft elevators on carriers were. Please don't look at their cycle times because the amount of histories I've read of World War II, which still quote the well of the 1920s cycle time of some of the British aircraft carriers' elevators for their cycle time in World War II. And I go, they upgraded those in 1936. They basically renewed the mechanism on all the old carriers in 1936. They did it to pretty much all of them in the same year. The ones they didn't do in 1936, they did in 1937. Stop quoting the timeline of the first generation of elevators at me. Sorry. Personal trauma reliving. Personal trauma. Lead up to one side. But no, this was really interesting how it took off. And it was a really interesting thing to think about because the main thing is I felt they would have been actually being built quicker. I think then you de really are dealing with a light cruiser scale build. And the speed at which the British could churn out a light, a light cruiser, even a, a, even a large light cruiser hull at this point, is quite dramatic. If they're not waiting for the 15-inch guns, their turrets, or the 18-inch guns and that turret, and the decision-making for that, they are quite an easy build. They're going to have quite a large hangar, I will admit, but they're not going to have their armour up on their flight deck because, mm, well, that's not really being considered. Look at Hermes construction. The armour deck is actually in the same place it would have been on a light cruiser at this time. So you're dealing with literally a large light cruiser hull, with a hanger and a flight uh, a hanger with, on top with a flight deck, elevators to service between the two, and an island structure. Does that really take that long to build? The thing is, the more I thought about it, the more I don't think the completion times actually fit when they would have been finished. And then there was an interesting question about, well, they're going to take a while to work up. And again, I was thinking about the wartime periods of working up. Again, those things were quite rushed. There were very reasons for various reasons for it. I thought about the generating of pilots' time, etc., and all those. And 
Whilst I don't think all three would have been in service at the time of the Battle of Jutland, by any stretch of the imagination, I don't think they'd have necessarily been there that quickly. I wouldn't be surprised if one of them might have actually been available for the battle. But still, I would really not be surprised if all three were in service and being thrown into a mission by Christmas 1916. Will they necessarily be fully re all three fully ready for it? That's a completely different matter. But Christmas 1916 does not seem like a bad timeline for me. Now, this is based on the fact that the hulls and them, well, they were launched in February... Uh, Courageous was launched in February 1916. Glorious launched in April 1916, and Furious was launched in August 1916. But again, there is the... F uh, whilst there is some in the scenario you've got going on, the fact is, for both... Um, for Courageous and Furious, both built at Armstrong Whitworth, they'd be building two of the same ship. So that could well have sped up some of their construction. And then they don't have to go to all the gunnery training, large gunnery training, because they're going to have some small guns on them, but they don't have that. And then, well, the thing is, there isn't an air group training system at place. They're, they're still working on that, and while they're going to be trials... The thing that might hold up any strike operation is going to be getting things like the SOP with PUP, which could well have been used as a fighter at this point, rather than SOP with Camel for them, and the SOP with Cuckoo into service. And the thing is, if you're ordering these sort of ships, the SOP with Cuckoo order probably comes in earlier. Does that mean that the engine's necessary ready? I, I don't know. It's, it's a whole thing to work through. But maybe one is ready, i.e. courageous, maybe. Launch February 1916, fitted out, etc. I could possibly see her having been with the Grand Fleet, at least by that point. Maybe as part of her workup, she's with them. And that provides a whole different scenario of what could take place. There's also, of course, the fact that probably BT shouting and screaming for them as their fast ships will lead up to one side. Um, the first one, they're probably going to get up, sent up to the ground fleet anyway to be worked up because that's the best area to do so. To work them up, to train them, to integrate them with the fleet. That That's where you're going to send them. So Courageous could have ended up in carrier form being part of the Battle of Jutland. And I don't know, that's going to depend on her air group, exactly how she what she happens and what gets achieved. But that would have been interesting. But leaving that to one side, let's say she's not included. Let's say, like certain battleships, she's left behind by... Jellico as not being ready. Well, by Christmas, she could have been ready. They could all have been ready. Because if you consider, Courageous is laid down in March 1915 and launched February 1916, and as I said, I think would be with the fleet quite quickly. Because again, what are you exactly finishing off? What are you going to be doing in the ship? The fuel systems gets built in. As it were, as originally, but the thing is, it's probably going to have an original generation fuel system at that point, which is not great, but also not as taxing on the ship construction. It's something which is probably going to have to be, they're probably going to have to have a major refit post-war to have a decent fuel management system put in. That That's going to be a big thing. Uh, and they'd have their own upgrade program post-war. They would be probably a race, moment war was over. We're taking these ships into dot, dot Y. We are rebuilding everything. <laughs> Um, but no, you could have all three, and honestly, I can't think of a worse time for the Germans to have an airstrike on them, on their fleet, considering the state it's in still, in Christmas 1916, than Christmas 1916. The damage that could have been done to that fleet, with how they arranged in harbour, any, any hits, etc., it will... At best, for the Germans, it will force them to move the fleet back the other side of the Kiel Canal and basically abandon... Well, it's 
probably going to force them back even further. They're, they're probably going to be forced back as far into the Baltic as they can get. Because they're going to overreact. Or worst case for them, Wilhelm reacts by thinking that the war is lost because the British are not able to attack his fleet and harbour as often as they like. And so orders the fleet to do a death ride for glory. I a go down, uh, uh, come back with your shield or sink with it scenario. And that would be traumatic. It really would. Anyway, that was the last of them. Uh, what have we got coming next week? French Naval Aircraft Squadron System. The, there is another book on its way. I, I, I heard it's a newer version of a book I have from years ago, and I thought, well, I should get the up-to-date edition before I start quoting it at all of you, and um, hopefully it'll be here soon. But then the French Naval Aircraft Squadron System is interesting. But the French Naval Aviation is interesting. It's a good history. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you liked the video. If you liked the video, please do like, share, and subscribe. We've got lots more videos coming. Uh, this week, we even have a slight difference in terms of lives because live is normally a Thursday it's actually going to be a Friday this week and this week's one is if Lord Fisher died in January 1914 how does Louis Badenburg perform as first sea lord and I think it's going to be an interesting one next week is next Thursday's one is zeros over the Mediterranean Japan joins Britain and free powers on 25th of June 1940 what happens that's an interesting one that is an interesting one honestly the Royal Navy goes well that that solves some problems and creates whole new ones. For the Americans, it could be especially difficult to work out what to do. That's going to be fun. Thank you very much for watching, and take care. I bet you thought I'd forgotten, but I've not. And there is a question, and it's a question which is suggested by the title. I'd like you to suggest the name of the series. We've got a few things going on in terms of themes. We've got long patrols, we've got short patrols. That's our long, long recorded videos versus the shorts. Uh, we have, well, lives are just called lives because I was lazy. But we have Patreon videos. We have Brew Ships as our Sunday series of Q&As, basically. Naval History Q&As and book reviews. And at the moment, a lot of book boxing. What would you like to see this series called? We've got key ships, key aircraft, key, person, uh, key people coming soon. But what would you like to see this series called? I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear your views, and I'd love to take in, uh, have your suggestions. So that's today's question. Can I please have your suggestions for what this series should be called? Take care.